Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this lecture video, we're going to be discussing hemoglobinopathies. All right, let's get started. I discussed the hemoglobin molecule in my previous lecture on hemoglobin, uh, but here is a picture of what the structure of hemoglobin looks like. So there are four heme groups with one iron molecule uh, in each of those, it's centrally located, of course. Along with those heme groups, there are four globin chains, and this is part of the structure uh, that's very important for this particular lecture. A hemoglobinopathy is a genetically determined abnormality of the structure or production of the hemoglobin molecule. Most specifically, this abnormality affects the globin portion of the molecule. So the heme portion is normal here, just the globin is uh, the issue. There are two different types of hemoglobinopathies, qualitative and quantitative. A qualitative hemoglobinopathy is where there is a structural abnormality of the globin chain, um, and this is caused by a single amino acid substitution in that globin chain. A quantitative hemoglobinopathy is where there is a synthesis or production abnormality of hemoglobin, and this is caused by a reduction of structurally normal globin chains. There just aren't enough globin chains being produced in a quantitative hemoglobinopathy. On the previous slide, I mentioned amino acid substitution. An amino acid substitution or deletion can alter the solubility, function, and stability of the hemoglobin molecule, and obviously that affects the red blood cell. Depending on what amino acid is substituted or deleted, the severity varies. I discussed this in my lecture on hemoglobin previously, but just as a reminder, these are the normal adult hemoglobin types. Hemoglobin A, or also referred to as hemoglobin A1, accounts for greater than 95% of all hemoglobin types in a normal adult patient. It's created with two alpha and two beta globin chains. Hemoglobin A2 accounts for less than 3% of all the hemoglobin types in a normal adult patient. It's created with two alpha and two delta globin chains. Hemoglobin F accounts for one to 2% of all hemoglobin types in a normal adult patient. It's created with two alpha and two gamma chains. If you need a more detailed review on these, please check out my hemoglobin lecture. The first hemoglobinopathy we're going to discuss is sickle cell anemia. This is caused by a nonpolar valine amino acid uh, substituted for a polar glutamine amino acid. This substitution changes the charge on the molecule and causes the formation of hemoglobin S, which is an abnormal hemoglobin type. So remember, for adults, it's A or A1, A2, and hemoglobin F. So hemoglobin S is not a normal uh, type of hemoglobin. So this uh, hemoglobin S molecule is caused by an autosomal recessive gene. Now there's something called sickle cell disease, which is caused by homozygous inheritance of the hemoglobin S molecule. And this results in both of the beta chains of the hemoglobin molecule to be abnormal. And then there is something called sickle cell trait when there is one normal and one abnormal beta chain from a heterozygous inheritance. So of course, I talked a little bit about it on the previous slide, but when discussing hemoglobinopathies, it's important that we understand the difference between disease and trait. So sickle cell disease is a homozygous mutation on the beta chain. So this results in no hemoglobin A being produced. It's all going to be hemoglobin S instead of hemoglobin A or A1. Um, so now hemoglobin A2 and hemoglobin F can still be made, but no hemoglobin A or A1 in this case. So 50% or greater of all the hemoglobin in this uh, person with sickle cell disease will be abnormal. Now, sickle cell trait is a heterozygous inheritance for the beta chain mutation. These patients produce some hemoglobin A or A1 and some abnormal hemoglobin. This results in less than 50% of the hemoglobin being abnormal. Sickle cell anemia is the most common of all hemoglobinopathies in the world. Its greatest prevalence is in tropical Africa, but it's also found commonly in equatorial Africa, the Caribbean, South and Central America, as well as the Mediterranean, Middle East, and Nepal. So we know that hemoglobin S is an abnormal hemoglobin, and that those with the disease uh, and trait either make no hemoglobin A or A1, or make reduced amounts of it. 
but how does this affect the patient? So hemoglobin S has a tendency to polymerize into rigid aggregates, um, assuming a crescent shape. Hypoxia, so reduced oxygen levels, acidosis, which is a decrease of pH in the blood, and temperatures above 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature, promote the deoxygenation and polymerization of hemoglobin S molecules. This polymerization into rigid aggregates damages the membrane of the red cell, and this may cause the cell to become irreversibly sickled. Once the red cell is irreversibly sickled, they are just stuck that way, regardless if the blood is oxygenated or not. So this photo on the right-hand side of the slide shows a peripheral blood smear of a patient that has sickle cells. So he, let's see, this is a sickle cell. All right, so these are sickle cells. Right. You can also see some target cells here. Oops, target cells here as well. There's another one. All right. So if sickle cells are seen on the peripheral blood smear, they are irreversibly sickled. Um, in, pa in a patient with sickle cell disease, 5 to 50% of all the circulating red blood cells are uh, irreversibly sickled. Patients uh, with sickle cell disease will experience chronic hemolytic anemia. Uh, can you think of why this is? So um, the body is going to be getting rid of these abnormal red blood cells. So they're going to be destroyed, leading to a hemolytic anemia. And these abnormal red cells are going to be produced throughout the patient's lifetime. Um, so this is going to be a chronic thing. Uh, this is going to be an extravascular hemolysis. So these red blood cells are going to be taken to the spleen to be destroyed. This can lead to something uh, called an autosplenectomy. Um, over time, all these red blood cells are being sequestered and destroyed in the spleen on a constant basis, and it can lead to infarctions, which are obstructions of blood supply to tissues. Uh, these repetitive infarctions can le uh, lead to a reduction in the size of the spleen, and that's autosplenectomy. Uh, patients with sickle cell can also experience something called a vasoocclusive crisis and acute chest syndrome. A vaso-occlusive crisis is an intensely painful episode caused by the sickle cells that cause the obstruction of blood vessels leading to ischemic injuries. The frequency, severity, and duration of vaso-occlusive crises uh, vary in each patient uh, with sickle cell disease. Pain management is given as well as IV fluids to keep the patient uh, hydrated during these events. Patients with sickle cell disease can also experience something called an acute chest crisis. Uh, this is actually the leading cause of death in patients with this disease. It's similar to vaso-occlusive crises, uh, but the occlusion of the blood vessels happens in the lungs. Uh, patients can be given antibiotics, supplemental oxygen, and blood transfusion for this. So in terms of the laboratory, uh, what kinds of things will we see uh, with a patient that has sickle cell disease? So there's something called a sodium dithionite solubility test, and I'll discuss this on the next slide, uh, but sickle cell patients have a positive sodium dithionite test. Electrophoresis of the hemoglobin can be performed, and this will show uh, that the patient has hemoglobin S present. Uh, patients will have a decreased red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit level. Uh, this makes sense because these abnormal red cells are going to be uh, prematurely lysed. Uh, you may also see an increased reticulocyte count from the body trying to compensate by producing more red blood cells and also an increase of platelets. Within the peripheral blood smear, of course, sickle cells will be seen. Target cells, basophilic stippling, and how jolly bodies can be present. Additionally, polychromasia and nucleated red blood cells can also be present. And this is caused by the bone marrow trying to compensate for the red blood cell loss. A shift to the left can also be seen. So this is an increase of immature neutrophil precursors in uh, the peripheral bloodstream. The sodium dithionite solubility test can be performed on patients to determine if they have the presence of hemoglobin S. The patient's blood is mixed with sodium dithionite. If hemoglobin S is present, it will precipitate out causing a turbid appearance. A normal hemoglobin will give a clear appearance. Um, or honestly, even abnormal hemoglobins will uh, give an abnormal or give a, uh, a clear appearance as well. Just hemoglobin S uh, causes that turbidity. So an example of this test is shown on the right hand side of this slide. 
So this test cannot be performed on newborns, however, because they have not fully begun to make beta chains yet. So this is the sodium dithionite test. So this is a positive sodium dithionite. So you see you cannot see these lines behind the tube, whereas you can see them here. Okay. So this one on the right hand side here, this is a negative sodium dithionite. That was supposed to be a star. It failed miserably. <laughs> That's a negative test. Um, and then this one over here is a positive test here. So treatment for those with sickle cell disease is avoiding conditions that cause deoxygenation of cells. So for example, patients should avoid climbing in the mountains. Uh, bone marrow transplants as well as blood transfusions may be recommended. Patients need to keep up to date with their vaccinations and can take prophylactic antibiotics to prevent bacterial infections. There is a drug called hydroxyurea, which at the time of this lecture recording is currently the treatment of choice for patients with this disease. This drug is uh, one that helps to increase the amount of hemoglobin F in uh, the red blood cell. For uh, patients with sickle cell trait, the hemoglobin A or A1 ratio to hemoglobin S is 60 to 40. So the reason that there is slightly more hemoglobin A is that um, alpha chains like to bond with normal beta chains rather than beta chains with this mutation. So generally these patients are asymptomatic but can still have problems if they get into a situation where they're at a deoxygenated state like mountain climbing and flying. Patients with sickle cell trait should seek genetic counseling before they have children. And the reason for this is that they have one abnormal mutation. And although they do not have symptoms usually, if they produce a child with a mate that also has a sickle cell trait, they have a chance of producing a child that has sickle cell disease. Hemoglobin C is an abnormal type of hemoglobin, like hemoglobin S. Uh, patients with hemoglobin C disease have very condensed, elongated rectangles, uh, crystal-likes, uh, that resemble the Washington Monument in their peripheral bloodstream. So here is one. Here is another one. And look, there's target cells too. All right. Um, so hemoglobin C disease is caused by a substitution for the amino acid lysine for the amino uh, acid glutamine at position six of uh, the beta chain. So this is not as severe as sickle cell anemia and most patients are asymptomatic. Um, those that do have symptoms may experience a mild hemolytic anemia, which is like experiencing fatigue and weakness. Some patients may also experience enlargement of the spleen and abdominal discomfort. The sodium dithionite solubility test on patients with hemoglobin C is negative. And the reason for that is that this is abnormal hemoglobin C and hemoglobin S is what precipitates in so sodium dithionite. So it'll be a negative, uh, negative test. Hemoglobin SC disease occurs when a patient inherits one copy of hemoglobin S and one copy of hemoglobin C. So one from each parent. Hemoglobin SC crystals are uh, from a cross between hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. They can be curved rectangles or bizarre shapes that kind of look like mittens or fingers. Uh, like with hemoglobin C crystals, you'll frequently see target cells present in the peripheral blood smear of patients that have the hemoglobin SC crystals. Uh, patients with hemoglobin SC disease will have symptoms of mild sickle cell anemia. Um, they can develop vasoocclusive crises and enlargement of the spleen. Hemoglobin D and hemoglobin E are other variants of hemoglobinopathies. Hemoglobin D occurs when the amino acid glycine is substituted for glutamic acid. Patients that have this hemoglobin are asymptomatic. Hemoglobin E is actually the second most prevalent hemoglobinopathy in the world. And this occurs when the amino acid lysine is substituted for the amino acid uh, glutamic acid. Patients with this are also asymptomatic. All right, so that ends our lecture on hemoglobinopathies. If this video helped you out, go ahead and give it a like, and please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational uh, content. All right, thank you. Have a good one.